Hello and welcome to Lady Dynamite Creates. Today we're going to be working on the Scarlet Witch and I have so much to show you so let's go ahead and get started. For the base I chose this headless headmistress blood good. She's a very interesting doll because her head just pops right off so it makes prep really easy. However I still did soak her head in some hot water because when I tried to scrape her out the first time nothing wanted to come because the glue was just so hard in there. I went ahead and prepped her like normal and shaved her head down. Then I scraped out all of the plugs with my flathead screwdriver and then pulled the gunk out with some needle nose pliers. It was really sticky and nasty after the hot water soak, so I did need to clean my tools off with a little bit of acetone. Then I used 100% acetone and I remove all of her factory paint. The thing that I don't really like about this doll base is the very hard jawline. So I decided I wanted to soften that up a bit and I just got out my Dremel with a very fine grit sanding drum and I just slowly shave that down until I get a shape I'm happy with. After I'm happy with the shape that I've gotten, I go ahead with some finer grit sanding paper passes and just get a nice smooth surface. And you can see here it's not a huge difference but it is enough to give it just a softer feel to the jaw. Then I'm going to get her prepped for her reroute and I'm painting her scalp a scarlet color to match her hair. The hair that I ordered wound up being too bright of a shade for the look that I was going for so I did wind up having to dye it and what I did is I dyed it a very deep scarlet color and then I brushed some of the original back into it to give it a nice highlighted feel through the hair. I also cut my hank in half because I am going for a shoulder style and just wanted it to hit right around her shoulders. And then I go ahead and get started rerouting. I loop the hair around my finger and then I pick up both sides of the loop with my needle and then I go ahead and tighten both of those ends so it forms a little knot. Then I plug that down into the hair and then I just go and fill in all of the holes. Then once I have all of my holes filled in I go ahead and put a little bit of liquid fusion glue into her head and use a q-tip to swirl that around making sure that I'm touching all of the plugs. This doll's head was on the harder side and I know from personal experience that if you try to squeeze these heads to get your glue good and mushed up in the head that it can split the scalp so I avoid doing that whenever I can. It's such an awful feeling to finally finish a reroute that took hours and hours and hours to only have the scalp split. After the glue in the head has had time to dry I go ahead and wrap up her hair in an old sock and this is just to protect the hair while I'm spraying sealant. Then on to her clothes. For my bodysuit here you can see I have sketched out my lines and these are my actual sew lines for the bodysuit. I find that when I am working on something that is so skin tight and stretched that it is easier to sew them in big pieces like this rather than work with those tiny seam allowances. The first thing I do is hem the sleeves and I hem the neckline as well. Then I'm going to sew up the back all the way up until my marked point. This particular pattern that I'm working with is one from DG Requiem and I'll leave the link in the description box below. I highly recommend this if you need to do a bodysuit. It is an excellent pattern. Now I fold the bodysuit in half and I match all of the seam lines up and pin it all together until it looks like a pincushion. Then I just sew and follow along the lines. After I've sewed all that down I can start trimming the side seams but honestly I should have waited until I fitted it on the doll. Um, as you can see here once it's on there are some baggy areas. But to fix that I take my little clips and I start clipping those along the sides and the back seam to start taking in the fabric. Once I'm happy with the tightness I take my fabric pin and I sketch out lines where the clips meet and just smooth that out. Then I take it off the doll, pin it all down together and sew those up. I was a little disappointed when I first started sourcing fabrics for this doll because I wanted a more sheer pink for the bodysuit and just couldn't find any that had a good amount of stretch. I wound up being really happy with this fabric in the long run because this had such a great amount of stretch to it that I was able to get it super tight on the doll. After I finished taking in all of the areas, I added a Velcro closure on the back. To get started on her bustier, I am first going to sew down the center seams all the way up to the notch. This particular pattern was just something I made real quick using some saran wrap and tape. I just simply put it on the doll and then sketched out where I wanted seam lines. Because this garment is very tight and using a thicker fabric, I do need to address the seams and they need to be very flat to avoid any kind of bumps and lumps in the final look. What I wind up doing is applying a little bit of fabric glue to both sides of the seams and then just ironing that out flat with my flat iron and I use a little bit of parchment paper to help protect it. This will give the final garment a nice crisp look. 
I did decide that I wanted to add some visual interest to this look because the overall design is very simple. So I chose to add two decorative top stitches that go down the center. And since I'm working with a synthetic pleather material, I am using my walking foot as well. As you can see, it helps glide the pleather through more smoothly than the normal presser foot does. After that's finished, I can sew the front center to the front sides along the princess seam. I make sure to match up my registration marks because that's what's going to keep it with the nice curvature to the chest. Once those are together, I can go ahead and clip the top and the bottom of the seam allowance so that there is a nice clean line. Then I press those seams flat as well, however this time I do not do a decorative stitch. I felt like it would just be too hard to keep it nice and neat going over the curvature. Before I can sew up the side seams, I do need to address the closures for this garment. I plan to use grommets to lace up the back, but because this is a stretch fabric, I need to apply a non-stretch to it since I'm adding grommets. If you try to add grommets to a stretch fabric without backing it first, what happens when the fabric stretches is it just stretches out from underneath the grommet itself and it just falls out. Once I have my backing in place, I go ahead and start marking where all of my holes should be. To make my holes, I take my awl and I just push it into the fabric. This separates the fibers rather than just making a hole in the fibers. When you make a hole, they can fray and become larger and larger and a lot of times you'll lose eyelets this way. But if you are separating and creating a gap in the fibers, it's more likely to hold in place. Once I have the gap large enough, I can slide the eyelet in and go ahead and set it as well. With all of the eyelets in place, I now sew up the side seam. And once those seams have been flattened, it's ready to be flipped right side out and then put it on the doll and lace it up. For her shoes, I modeled new ones that'll fit the big sister body type. So these will be available in my Etsy store when this video goes live, so check them out. I put them on her and then wrapped her up in saran wrap and tape. I then sketched out the sole line as well as the front and the back seam and then carefully cut it off the doll. I turned it into a paper pattern and then I added in my seam allowances and once I was satisfied with that, I went ahead and cut it out of the same fabric that I used on the bodice. I match up the front seams of the boot first and sew those down. And just like I did with the bodice, I flatten out those seams as well. And I give it decorative top stitching down the front too. I found that when doing visible stitching like this, it's best to go nice and slow. This way you get a nice, even crisp line. After you finish up the decorative stitches, go ahead and sew up the back and then flatten that seam out as well. I then flip my boot cover right side out and start getting ready to fit it onto the shoe. I just use a little bit of super glue and then I apply the toes down onto the boot and then the heel. However, if I was to do this again, I would do it in reverse. It's a little bit easier to match up the heel than the toe because it is easier to stretch the toe rather than the heel. And I did want to say a special thank you to everyone who has subscribed to the channel. I got my notification this week that I have reached a thousand subscribers and honestly that is not something I thought I would actually achieve. I just wanted to say thank you so much for your support. Once I have the front and the back done, I go ahead and glue down those sides as well, matching up the edges. Now, a few of the edges are a little bit over my line, so I take an X-Acto blade and very carefully cut those up and peel them off. Only thing that's left on the shoes is to give the soles a paint job and they go right on the doll. I'm using a half circle cape pattern as well as this rectangle to give the ruched area around the neck. And the first thing I do is do gathering stitches around the two sides and the neck hole. To do the gathers, I'm using a much longer stitch length so that the thread doesn't break. 
With the right sides facing, I attach the two gathered ends of the rectangle to the gathered neck hole of the cape. For her headpiece, I went into 3D Max and sculpted one out, and then I printed it out on my Elegoo Mars. Let me know if doing some 3D modeling and setting up supports would be something you would be interested in seeing in a future video. I clean up the print, sanding away any of the roughness left by the supports. Then I'm going to add this pin with a little bit of UV resin, and this is going to help me attach it to the doll later. Then I mix that paint about a million times before I'm able to get something that's a pretty close match to her outfit. Then I give the headpiece a base coat and I seal it. Her hands I actually dyed in the same dye that I used on her hair. I just left them soaking in some warm writ dye more for about an hour. But I wanted her hands to actually look like she was casting the magic, so I take my heat gun and I just heat the hands up just a little bit and slowly start shaping out the fingers into different shapes until I get something that I like. I just kind of hold it in place and then give it a quick spritz with the canned air and this just kind of freezes the plastic into place and sets it. And I wanted one of her hands to look like it was kind of holding a ball of the magic ready to throw it and the other one to look like it was in the act of throwing the magic and casting it. For the actual magic itself, I took a little bit of clear warbler and I cut them into these little bitty strips. And I heated them up and then just pulled and twisted and turned and curled and stretched until I got the shape that I like. I then glued these to the LED with a little bit of super glue. This was my first time working with the clear warbler and I have to say I'm not a big fan of it. I definitely like traditional warbler better because this, while you can mash it together and make it form a piece, it doesn't glue to itself like regular Warbler does, so that is where the actual super glue comes into play. I'm having to super glue these pieces in. And in case you're wondering what it was I just sprayed there, uh, that was just a little bit of super glue accelerant. I was finding that it wasn't gluing itself quickly enough and was falling off a lot of times, so I'd have to put the glue down, put the piece in place, and then do a little squirt. So now to make the circuit for the LED so her hands actually light up with her magic. So first we take our positive wire, we connect our positive wire to our positive leg on our first LED, our negative leg to our connective wire, then our connective wire to our positive leg on the next LED, then the negative leg on that one to the negative wire on the battery pack. And the way you can tell the difference on this battery pack, which one is positive and negative because usually they're red or black, is the negative wire on this one has little dashes to indicate negative. The way I like to solder my LEDs is first thing I do is I cut it a little bit shorter. Then I take some round nose pliers and I curl that up into a little circle. Then I take my wire piece and I form a little hook onto it. I then hook my wire into the circle and then give it a little twist to secure it. I place my LED into my third hand for the soldering portion and what I do is I poke my solder through the little hole and then have my soldering iron on the other side and this helps make a more solid bond where it flows on both sides. I clean my joint up just a little bit and then I go ahead and use a little bit of heat shrink tubing to protect that joint and you can use a heat gun or a lighter to secure that on. After that, I just finish up all of my connections and then I have a complete circuit. Ta-da! Magic! Now onto the face up. I did mix up a few custom pan pastel colors this time around because the colors I had just came out a little bit too orange. After prepping her in two layers of Mr. Super Clear, I go ahead and get started on her first layer, just sketching out those eyes. And once I'm happy with the shape, getting the eye whites filled in. The inspiration of this, of course, is WandaVision, and after seeing the episode of her in the Halloween costume, I was just like, I have to do an old school Scarlet Witch costume, and immediately went out and started trying to source fabrics, which was way harder than it needed to be. I really enjoyed the show, and I'm glad they finally did give her her own superhero costume, because it was always weird in the movies how she was the only one who didn't really have a costume. Everyone else did, but she didn't. I'm glad they finally gave her something that paid homage to her original costume. 
I first got into like superhero stuff when I was a kid and I used to love watching the X-Men and the Wildcats cartoons and they were just so awesome but we couldn't afford comics when I was a kid. Comics are freaking expensive especially if you read the amount I did as a kid. We couldn't afford that kind of a pull list. Uh, and our local library just really never had uh, trade papers or anything like that. So what I would do is I would go buy the little trading cards and I would just read all about like the different X-Men and things like that. And I just, I loved those. However, as I got to be older and stuff and got my own pool list as an adult, I did find myself gravitating more towards the DC stuff over the Marvel. I just felt like DC had better storylines. Like Black as Night was like one of the best storylines. I loved that one. However, I feel like DC's kind of dropped the ball with their movies. Like, Marvel just had better movies, although the new Justice League Zack Snyder cut is freaking awesome. I'm finding these days, though, I'm not reading as much in the superhero genres anymore. I'm doing a lot more independent stuff, like I'm really into Saga and The Wicked and Divine. I really like those. Okay, enough geeking out. I should probably talk about the face-up. I've done a first pass on all of the contouring to the darker areas and when I was working on this the colors was coming out a little bit too orange so I mixed up a custom color that pulled it back a little bit towards the blue tones and then I did go in and add in some details with just blue pastels into some areas that would get deeper shadows. I give her a light dusting of pearlescent pink on the apples of her cheeks and on her forehead and then I start smoking out her eyeshadow. I start adding in some lip color. I picked this one and it wound up being a little bit too purple so I had to bring in a, a brighter red. And then that finishes off layer one. At the beginning of layer two I start sketching in her iris shape. I sketched in the right one first and then the left but then realized that the left one was a little off center but I liked the way it looked better so I erased the right one and decided to have her kind of side eye in whoever she's attacking. To erase it, I'm just using a little bit of water on a brush and then just rubbing it across there, picking it up. I use this dark red to add some details up into the lips, really highlighting that center divot. And then I start adding in some of the red to the waterline. I use a deeper red towards the corners and then a lighter pink in the middle. I decided I wanted her eyeshadow to hint towards red, not being an outright red. So I added in just a little bit of watercolor pencil shading just to help pull it more towards that warm tone. Then I used a darker shade to smoke it out and then I blended it with a Q-tip. I use a little watercolor pulled directly off the pencil to uh, darken up the lip crease. And I block out her eye color and I'm using a darker color to ring it and a bright vibrant red in the middle. I detail out around the eye some more, darkening up the eyeliner and then adding some shadow to the whites of the eyes. I also do another pass to brighten up the sclera in the non-shaded area. I wound up being really happy with how her eyes turned out. The last time I tried to do cat eyes, it was an epic failure. And my style tends to be a more wide-eyed, open, sweet look. I'm glad I could redeem myself from my ringmaster fail. I start trying to push the color a little bit more in the iris pushing the contrast to greater depth. And finally on layer two, the last thing I do is I hit the bottom of the iris with a little bit of white. And this just pushes the, the glow effect of the eyes a little bit more so she really looks like she is actively casting. First thing I do on layer three is start sketching in her eyebrows. And I do this first because I always mess up a good bit and have to erase. So it's better to not have to erase other work as well. I just sketch it out with some pastel and then use an eraser to refine it to the shape that I like. 
Once I have the appropriate arched look, I go ahead and move on to adding in some detailed striations to the eyes, and I'm hitting that with a darker brown. Then I add in some striations of gold metallic watercolor to really give it that pop glow. I add in her top and bottom eyelashes, and I do this in two passes. My first pass is with a harder leaded watercolor pencil, and then the second one is a little bit softer and darker color, and I do that just to darken up the very edge of the lashes. The last thing I do on layer three is detail out some individual hairs in the eyebrows. Layer four is all about final touches and highlights. So I take my pastel pencil and I highlight right around her tear ducts then the bridge of her nose and then I use a little bit of pastel that's loose and blend out some on her forehead and on the apples of her cheeks. Then with a little bit of white gouache, I go ahead and add in some of the highlights to her waterline and try to add in her catch lights. But the first time I add it on, I kind of glob it on by accident and apply way too much paint. So using a wet Q-tip, I go and I pick that up and then reapply the correct catch lights. I don't usually show styling the hair. I don't have a really great setup for that. I'm trying to get better, but uh, off camera, I have trimmed this to the appropriate length. So it's all nice and even. And now I'm wetting it down and this just makes it a little bit easier to work with. I then take masking tape and I apply it to the bottom of the hair. And this just helps hold it in place while I'm rolling it in the curler. I just tape that across to the roller and then roll it up and then fold it under. I then pour a little bit of near bowling water onto this and then let these curls dry. Once it's dry, I can unroll the hair and as you can see, it gave it way more curl than I really needed. So what I do to tame this down is I just pull a hair tie around it so that it's kind of tucked into the neck. And this helps just to tame it down to give it the just slight flip that I was wanting. Thank you guys so much for watching and please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. And remember, always be creating.